Welcome back. We uh, apologize for the glitches that uh, you, we are experiencing. And uh, just to make you aware that the uh, full recording of today's sessions and Q&A will be online. So you can uh, download it and listen to it at a later time. And there will be no glitches in that. Uh, you can find that at Heritage Live. Uh, on YouTube, our YouTube channel, and it's at discoverheritage.ca slash backslash live. Well, we've had a good session number one from Dr. Pawalki. Uh, we've learned that uh, as ministry leaders, we need to gain the trust of people. We need to endure in our ministry and we need to be thoughtful about our su succession plan. Very wise counsel. Thank you, Dr. Pawlke, and we uh, now hand it over to you for session number two. Well, welcome back. It's good to be back, and uh, this is for Rick. Rick. Rick, I want you to know that if you'd like one of these mugs, a little bit of product placement, uh, I could get you one of these mugs uh, if you would like. Happy to do that. Uh, I want to give a bit of a commercial, not, not for, uh, kidding aside on this, but for Christian higher education. Uh, I've been asked to do this, but you need to hear this, especially pastors. So we know that 10 years ago, the Hemorrhaging Faith study told us that two-thirds of our high school uh, age young people would leave the church. A number of years later, a subsequent study was done uh, called Renegotiating Faith, it told us that nothing had changed, but it even told us more information. It told us that not only will two thirds, two thirds of our emerging adults, young people as they leave high school, enter into the next phase of their life, college, university, work, two thirds will leave the church and half of that number or one third, the total, uh, will completely abandon their faith. And so we look around our churches and wonder where are young people? That is a frightening, stark, troubling statistic. Now, further study looked at the data more deeply, and it looked at the retention number. And uh, some, some significant learnings as to, to why those who stuck with their faith stayed with their faith. And things like mentorships, service played a critical role. Having people engage in mentoring relationships or in service, relations, service opportunities in that transition. The other two factors, camp work. Fascinating to see students that were involved in serving in camps uh, was a significant con uh, connector. And then the last one was Christian higher education. And so for those students who spent even as little as one year in a place like Heritage, uh, that could be a significant life grounding time spent. And so pastors, leaders, uh, we need to talk up the value of Christian higher education. And I know there's cost, but... Um, you know, to parents who have uh, wayward children that have not prepared them for college and university, um, they will deeply regret that. And so I'm not, Christian education can't make promises, but we know the statistic significantly increases in the retention side of things if we encourage our young people to spend even, even a year. And many of our Christian higher ed schools have institutions, have all kinds of degree programs, which lead into marketplace uh, work and ministry, but even a year of grounding so valuable. Well, there's my promotion and my advertisement, my commercial. Listen, every pastor has a sideways story where things have gone sideways, unanticipated, unexpected, unwelcomed, but it happened nonetheless. I certainly have a few here at Barkers, and I'm not going to tell you a story from here right now because uh, I don't want to get into trouble, uh, but I will tell you an older one. But I'll tell you an older one, not just because it's safer. I'll tell you an older story because it, it just illustrates in such significant ways of this principle of the necessity for good judgment. So it's 1994. And I'm telling you that because it, I was a lot younger, uh, no silver on top here. It's 1994 and uh, I'm Mike the young church planter. And I've just arrived in Burlington, Ontario. And uh, I've just served eight years as a church planter. And as a church planter, you know, everything that happened had my fingerprints on it. That's the nature of church planting, right? And we would change things in a dime. If something didn't work Sunday, we'd change it on Tuesday. If something didn't work on Wednesday, we'd change it on Friday. Things just changed all the time and people rolled with it, right? 
So I, I come to a church with a, a rich 70 year history. Our denominational leader tells me, Mike, this is, this is a plum. This is a, a wonderful church. It's a healthy church. And it was, they, it was a sizable church, multi, multiple staff, uh, lots of young families, a lot diverse age demographic, uh, great building, uh, some indebtedness, but nobody was stressed about it because it was in a, a more of a, a middle-class, upper middle-class uh, setting in the Golden Horseshoe. And, uh, and, and so they said, we want you to come with your youthful vision, with, with your experience, with your energy. And, and we, we, we were inviting you to, to bring change. And this was the mandate, the expectation from, from the leaders. And so when I arrived in the summer of 1994, I hit that pavement full sprint. Like, no, I, I hit it running. And we started changing things immediately because, you know, they always said, you know, we're ready for change. So I started changing things that summer. And I changed names, I changed titles, I changed programs, I, I changed the dress code, I changed so many. We started a second service, and the second and first service would both be contemporary. And you got to remember, this was a time in the, in the 90s when uh, music was still a bit <clears throat> controversial, if you will. And so all these rapid changes, and I changed our pulpit. Now, we had a lovely building. And we had this beautiful, enormous, ginormous oak piece of furniture. And it, it even had a, an area for the, the, the um, overhead projector uh, to sit on. It was, it was phenomenal. It was, it was a beautiful piece of furniture. But I sat down with our elders and I explained to them how uh, uh, the, the, the least, most believable, trusted communicator is somebody standing behind some sort of object, obstruction or some sort of uh, lectern. That's your least, your least believable then. The next most believable is a person who, who is standing without any uh, object or, or structure in front of them. And then the most trusted person is a person sitting across from you. And so, and, but there are actually studies to, sh to show this. And so I walked this through the elders. Like, can, I, can I move the pulpit? Because I, I, was, I wasn't a rookie. I, I, I want to get permission to move the pulpit. <laughs> and I said, well, sure, move the pulpit. So I moved, moved the pulpit and that was, that was like the last straw. For, for the plethora of lesser changes that I had engaged in, now people had had enough. And as I said in an earlier session, externally things were growing and there was a lot of good things happening externally and on the surface. But behind the scenes, I started to get the notes. And remember, it's pre-email. So people are you know, sliding notes underneath my, my door into my office and they were horrible. They were terrible. I mean, I was being compared to, you know, the, the false prophets of Jeremiah, these evil deceivers who were pulling God's people away. And I, I was just, I was a mess. And it, um, it actually culminated in a special meeting some 18 months later into it. It was, a, as I said, it was a tough first year and a half. And there was a special meeting. At the special meeting, uh, I sat through three hours of complaints and dissatisfaction and I was I was a mess no other word for it and um, I was truly uh, truly wanted to, wanted to leave and as I said earlier by by God's grace nothing else by God's grace I, I endured and stuck with it and um, and things emerged out of that uh, very difficult season. The learning, however, came probably another couple of years after that. I was introduced to a book called Reframing Organizations by Bowman and Deal. And uh, you, uh, you can buy this book. Uh, it will be a $50, $60 book. But let, let me give you uh, the, the summary. Uh, Bowman and Deal talk about how you frame problems. And they said, you need to look at a problem from different lenses. You see, you, you need to look at problems and decisions from a lens of, of, of structure of politics, of symbol, and of human relations, okay? And so I, I use that template or, or use those lenses, and I, I look back at the bumpy start I had at my church. And the conclusion I came to was that 90% of the stress I experienced was self-inflicted. Now, I'm not saying there weren't some hurtful things said in emails, and I'm not saying that there wasn't some, some, some pain slung my way. But I made some decisions, some bad decisions, not unethical decisions, not immoral decisions, not sinful decisions. I made decisions with good motives. 
but I made some bad decisions in those early days. And I created problems for myself. Okay, so let me let me just quickly use the, the Bowman and Deal reframing a conversation briefly. And some of you have seen this before, but I just this this profoundly shaped uh, not only my interpretation of that season of my life, but how I function now. Always looking at things through multiple lenses. That's why you kind of gather as much information about every decision you're facing. <clears throat> so structurally, what did I do? Well, I did, I did something right structurally because I talked to the board. I said, "Can I move the pulpit?" Yes. Okay, I get full marks for that. Um, Politically, missed it, missed it. I've gone from a church plant situation where if you were in leadership, you were on the board. I knew who the leaders were and you were serving, okay? You come into a larger setting, you know, boards are, there's rotations, there's all kinds of players, there's all kinds of pillars, there's all kinds of influencers. And there are all kinds of people who had significant influence in the church who weren't the board. And that's why it's valuable when you come into a new setting to have lots of lunches and lots of coffees and lots of conversations to listen, to hear from people, to get a sense of what's gone on, what's historically happened, what's valued, what's cherished. And I, and I, I was naive in terms of politics. Don't see politics always as a negative word. I mean, it's a reality. Okay. And I made some political misjudgment there. There were some key leaders that I wasn't getting to know. And they had opinions, and I was not connecting with them. I was not communicating with them. I was not um, building relationships with them. So structural, political. <clears throat> then there's the symbolic lens, and I moved the pulpit. Now, today, is like, I mean, I'm embarrassed when I tell you this story, to be honest. But, but, you know, this tremendous symbol. And so, you know, here I move a, a, a rich historic symbol. In fact, you know what pulpits used to be called? The sacred desk. And what sat on the sacred desk? The infallible and errant inspired word of God. Okay. And what does Powelke do? This young church planter from Winnipeg, he rips the pulpit off the stage. And what does he place in its in, in its place? Well, a flimsy music stand, but what's what center stage now? What's behind? The, the drums. Okay. So the optics, the symbol, missed it. I completely missed it. And there's one more lens, the human relations lens. And the human relations lens is all about, you know, people. And a couple of years after this episode in my life, about the time I'm reading this, I'm talking to one of our board members. And he says to me, oh, that pulpit was donated by the, this family. And I said, you're kidding. There was no plaque on it. No, we, we just didn't put plaques and things. And here, I, somebody had spent thousands of dollars on this beautiful oak piece of furniture. And the new guy rips it off the stage, and, and uh, I turned it into the Welcome Center, actually, is what it did. And uh, completely missed the, the human relations component and how that might have been interpreted by people who, who donated uh, lots of money for a nice piece of furniture for the front of the church. Bad judgment. Bad judgment on my part. So let's talk about good judgment. And I intentionally call this leadership's best practice. And I know we use the word best practice to, to sort of uh, describe uh, a package of practices, if you will, but I'm actually using it in a singular fashion. I, I would actually argue, I, I seldom do this, but I actually argue that this, this is the top of the list. I mean, assuming the permission to play values and, and assuming godliness and assuming, you know, rich dynamic relationship with God where there's integrity. But in terms of quality, I look for good judgment. Yeah, vision's important. Yes, change manager's important. Yes, financial aptitude is important. Yes, team buildings. Lots of leadership complexity. Lots of leadership skills needed to lead in, in our time. But I look for people with good judgment. Okay, this matters. And I'd like to make a bit of a pitch for why I think this is such a critical skill uh, for leadership and how best practice all will flow out of this quality of good judgment. Psalm 119, verse 66 says this, teach me good judgment and knowledge for I believe in your commandments. So here the psalmist is writing, and this is a great psalm of, of, of honoring the word of God. But in this psalm, the psalmist says, I believe in your commandments. I've received your revelation. I trust your revelation. I, I, I rest on your revelation. I'm, I'm governed and shaped by your revelation. Now teach me good judgment. Help me to apply that knowledge. Help me to execute it into life. Okay. And so here, good judgment is extolled as a powerful virtue and quality necessary, okay? 
So let's look at another leadership case study. Let's look at Solomon again uh, in his better days. And uh, when he was appointed to become king, he was probably about 20 years of age. And in 1 Kings chapter 3, this is what we read in chapter 3, verse, verse 3, actually. As Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. Let me just say, this was before the temple was built, and the high places weren't these dark places of idolatry that they later become. Okay, so this wasn't all bad. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was a great high place. And Solomon used it to offer a thousand burnt, burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant. There's that Hesed love. There's that loyal love again. You've shown great Hesed love to your servant, David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept him for this great and steadfast love, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father. Although I am but a little child, again, about 20, uh, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for the multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern your great people? So here we, you have Solomon's plea and petition and request for discernment and for wisdom. And, and I'd like to suggest that good judgment is the final expression of wisdom. It's the execution of wisdom. Wisdom is that, that framework of, 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 and we're going to talk about that now, that framework of, of navigating through all the data so that it ultimately culminates in the execution of good judgment. So let me turn to a classic passage that teases out how to discover how to flesh out, how to develop good judgment. And I want to stay with Solomon, but this time take you to Proverbs, Proverbs 24. Okay. Proverbs 24, great passage that illustrates this beautifully. Okay. And I should move my slides on here a bit for you. And let me take you to Proverbs 24. I passed by the field of the sluggard, the, the Solomon says, by the vineyard of the man lacking sense, and behold, it was overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles. And stone wall was broken down. And then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, with folding of hands to rest in poverty come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. So the, the picture here and the, the skill presented here is, is, is one where, where Solomon is observing life. And he's saying, I'm going past this field of, of a person who had the reputation of being a sluggard. He was lazy. But his reputation of being lazy was well earned because when I looked at his field, it was all overgrown. It wasn't cared for. There were weeds everywhere. The, the stone walls were all broken down. And I saw, observed, and I reflected. I considered, I interpreted and then the, the subsequent axiom, the application, the insight. If, if, you, if you're not industrious, if you're not diligent, if you don't put some effort into your life, everything's going to fall apart. You'll end up living in a field that's dilapidated and broken down and overgrown in weeds. And so I want us to think about this whole quality of wisdom uh, for a few moments. And I want you to think in terms of how how the Proverbs lay out this appeal, this plea for wisdom. So when you read the Proverbs, you see that the, the book of Proverbs explores all these contrasts, wisdom versus folly, okay? Generosity versus stinginess, joy versus anger, love versus lust, diligence versus laziness, good versus bad, uh, 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 real verse, uh, versus, versus uh, security, uh, false security, uh, justice issues, and of course, what God loves and what he hates. And these are just some of the contrasts that are given to us uh, in, in the pages of scripture. But here's, here's a summary of how we might think of, of wisdom in scripture. Okay? Biblical wisdom is fundamentally about discovering good judgment. 
Okay. It's about objective analysis. It's, it's about executive functioning. And we might use executive functioning to think of it in terms of, uh, of cognitive degeneration, somebody whose who's, who's cognitive abilities are beginning to decline. But, but really good executive judgment is, is the ability to think objectively, okay? To, to, uh, to, assess, to amass data, to assess data, uh, to, to be able to plan, to be able to control your emotions somewhat. But, but I'd like to suggest one of the things it, it's really strong about, it's, it's, it's this capacity to explore cause and effect. Cause and effect. If I decide to do this, these are the subsequent consequences that will take place. And if I don't do this, these will be the results and consequences that we set into motion. And so wisdom has this ability to look at the head, look forward to the future. Okay. What are the implications? Where, where is this decision going to take me? Okay. And so developing moral skillfulness. Um, living successfully versus uh, the consequences of folly. This is really the heart of what wisdom is all about. And so my thesis today, management matters, vision matters, people skills matter, um, team building matters, but good judgment, good judgment should be at the top of the list. Let me invite you to think of it this way. We talk about love. And uh, we all know that love is more than emotion. We've taught it from the pulpit. We've taught it from our, in our Bible studies. And, and we know culture is, is obsessed with this misconception that love is an emotion. You, know, you fall into love, you fall out of love. Uh, Disney tells us to follow our heart. And, uh, and we have this very narrow, simplistic view of what love is. But biblical love, hesed love, agape love, if you will, uh, is, is substantive. It's gutsy. It, it's, it's reflected in commitment and in sacrifice. And it's something that, yes, involves emotion, but it's something so much more. It involves the will, it involves thought, it involves forgiveness and not bringing in the past. And again, read 1 Corinthians 13. It's not just a wedding passage. It's, it's dynamic. It's alive. It's powerful. Okay. But sometimes we make uh, too much of the emotion when love is so much bigger. Well, I'd like to suggest all too often leaders make decisions based on emotions. Well, this just felt right. Now, I, I confess I'm a bit more of an intuitive leader as well. You know, things, this just seems right. But, but boy, you need to add more thinking to your feeling. And while something might feel right, you need to think it through. Where's this decision going to take? You need to think cause and effect. So, again, I'm going to ask this. How will we develop good judgment? And I'm going to use something uh, very uh, well-known in terms of a grid to help us make decisions. And I want to start with observation, okay? Gather data. That's what the writer of Proverbs did, Proverbs 24. He, he went by a field and he assessed, he observed. So gather data, gather as much data as you possibly can. And the first bit of data is, is the why and what. I mean, we're, why do I even have to make this decision? And let me just at the outset, before anything else, acknowledge this. If the decision that is before you is somehow, somehow moral in its implications, then the decision's made. That's the paradigm you need to function. Gather more data, that's fine. But if, if the decision has a moral component to it, if there's something ethical, if, there, if there's some sort of black and white absolute attached to this, then now you need courage and now you need implementation, certainly. But the actual nature of the decision, it should be made for you. Friends, we need to remind ourselves uh, of our blind spots. And, and throughout the history of the church, the history of the church has some wonderful, glorious contributions to society. We built, built schools and universities and we built hospitals and hospices and, and, and orphanages and relief centers and, and food pantries. We've done so much good for society. Don't ever let society tell us that we haven't. We've done tremendous good, but throughout our history, we have endorsed at times, we collectively, we've endorsed slavery and we've endorsed uh, anti-Semitism. 
And we've endorsed the use of violence. You know, some of the reformers there, some of their pasts were checkered, okay? We, we, we've endorsed some methods of abuse. We've endorsed uh, uh, versions of caste systems and we've had economic disparity and, and we've had uh, discrimination and partiality. So, so we've got some blind spots. So let me just say, if the decision that is before you is somehow, somehow has moral ethical implications, then that's your decision. And you and I need courage to just simply say, this is the right thing to do. Okay, I need to say that at the front end. But beyond that, gather data, gather information. Because like I said, decisions are usually more complex than we see. Moving the pulpit was a big decision. And I didn't see the complexity surrounding that decision. So have conversations, have gather data, look at cause and effect. If I would have thought, okay, I'm moving this pulpit, what's, what, what's the nature of the pulpit, thought through the symbolic implications, the human relations implications, and now what I might be setting into motion. And I thought through, okay, maybe it was the right decision, but that was not the way to do it. There are all kinds of, there's all kinds of data that might've helped refine that decision for me. So gather data. And then of course, the subject of, of when. Okay, when do I ex execute this decision? Because timing is part of decision-making. Timing is part of good judgment. You might be making the right decision at the wrong time, okay? Remember Will, Wilberforce, William Wilberforce? He, he did battle with the British Parliament to change the laws of slavery in the United Kingdom, in Great Britain. It took him decades, and he had to develop a long view as to how he would implement this. It took him all kinds of steps and compromises along the way. And some people would have challenged, some people did challenge him for his compromise along the way. But his, his perspective was, I'm gonna keep chiseling away until I accomplish my objective. And he knew it would take time. And so he developed the long, so gather data as best you can. Then what we wanna do is harmonize that data that interpretation. Now, I don't have a matrix for you. I don't have you have a Venn diagram for you to, to, to do this, but write some of these things down, right? Write, write, write some of these observations down. And as you see all the data, it's amazing how often the, the clarity will just come to the surface. So gather all the data, assemble all the data till, it, till a kind of cohesive, make sense kind of decision emerges. But then lastly, there's the application, execute the decision. But you need to ask how. How will we execute or communicate this decision? Because packaging matters, always. And for those of you here who are married, you might have to have a conversation with your spouse. You know you have to have a conversation uh, about some particular theme, about the children, about work, about money, about whatever. But you better know by now that packaging, how you're going to frame that conversation matters big time. And it's the same with decision making. If you're talking to a veteran leader, if you're talking to a board member, if you're talking to a staff colleague, if you're talking to someone who's significantly your elder or significantly your junior, how are you going to shape this conversation? How are you going to shape this decision? How are you going to shape? How are you going to execute this good judgment? Because how, how you clothe it and how you distribute it, how you engage in conversation around it uh, could make all the, might be the right decision, but bad judgment rules in how you present it and you, you, you mess it up, okay? I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I wanna illustrate this with perhaps, uh, and I'm, I'm, I've thought about this, I'm doing this intentionally. I wanna illustrate this with perhaps the most um, uh, dominant, uh, threatening, cultural issue before us today. And that's the whole uh, sexual identity, gender identity, LGBTQ conversation, okay? Here's what I uh, often say uh, to student development and to our environment as a whole. That when we talk about this theme and, and we, we have students here, we have, we have emerging adults, we have students coming from high school, uh, who have very little perspective on it. If, if, if they have any perspective, it's culture's perspective. And I'm talking children from churches, young people from churches. But, but when I speak about this issue, there's, there's two things that I have to constantly hold in tension. And you almost have to hold these two themes in tension in the same sentence. Okay, certainly in the same talk, but in the same sentence. 
There needs to be both clarity and compassion. There needs to be clarity in our convictions and there needs to be compassion and care in our, in our conversation and our delivery. So let me illustrate this. Clarity. Uh, we, we've got to be absolutely clear uh, that the teachings of scriptures about sexuality are that sexual intimacy is a, is a beautiful, wonderful gift from God. And it is to be richly enjoyed in the exclusive context of a heterosexual, monogamous covenant marriage. And anything, anything beyond that, anything outside of that is a departure from God's plan. Whether it's same sex, whether it's premarital sex, whether it's extramarital sex, whether it's imagined and, and um, 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 through pornography, what, anything, that's a, anything that's a departure from that, from a monogamous heterosexual covenant marriage is, is a violation of departure from God's cherished ideal. Okay. So, so we need to be really clear on, on what our sexual ethic is, uh, what our view of marriage is. And the significance of marriage, how God has brought together two, a binary of two genders into a, a, a committed covenant relationship. Okay. But then there also needs to be compassion. Because, well, we know gender dysphoria is real. And people have their struggles and people have their wrestlings. And we know that culturally and the, the, the dominant message of, of the lobbying message of LGBTQ is very harsh and strong, but, but for individuals who are struggling with this and they're grappling with the biblical message and they're wrestling with this, we need to have a, a disposition of care and compassion, a pastoral disposition, okay? When you look at the gospels, you will see that Jesus, he spoke with great firmness to the Pharisees because they knew better. You whitewashed tombs, you hypocrites. But when he spoke to the woman at the well, when he spoke to the woman caught in adultery, when he spoke to Zacchaeus, he exuded tremendous grace. And so this whole balance of, of, of care and compassion and clarity, it's like John chapter one, Jesus came in grace and truth. Okay. And both are necessary. Now here, here's the problem. If all we are is clear on our position, then we risk sounding harsh and self-righteous, okay? If all we are is compassionate, we risk sounding like we've, we've uh, abdicated or, or, or capitulated on truth. And so I chose that intentionally, but with whatever you, other sense of controversy, recognize the tension, there should be clarity, but there needs to be packaging matters, okay? Packaging matters. So give some thought to this. Observation, gather data. Interpret it, reflect upon it, consider it, harmonize the data. What, what is all this data telling me about the quality of decision I should be making here? And then how will I dispense the decision? How will I execute judgment? How, how will it be over time? Will, will it be a conversation? How do I commun communicate clearly and yet uh, compassionately? So this is for us to, to give some careful thought about. Now, let me give one more illustration on the macro observ observation, gathering data, interpretation of, of harmonizing the data and, and application, executing the decision. I'm in Saskatchewan right now. And uh, through the pandemic, one of the things my wife and I have done a lot of is walking. We, we walk all the time. We walk many nights, certainly the weekends, we'll walk uh, multiple kilometers. And we'll go to parks, we'll, we'll do hikes and uh, having a wonderful time doing that. Now in Saskatchewan, it's cold and it snows. And often when it snows, uh, we don't plow the roads. We just drive over the snow and create ruts and you drive in those ruts. And <laughs> if you're from Saskatchewan, you know I'm not exaggerating. It's, it's, it tends to be reality for an awful lot of uh, the province. So one of the places my wife and I like to, to hike in is, is Nicole Flats. It's about 25, 30 minutes away. And we'll drive up there and it's a beautiful area right in the, the edge of Buffalo Pound Park and Buffalo Pound Lake. And we can hike into the woods as well. Yes, there are trees in Saskatchewan. And so on this particular day, uh, we were driving up, it was cold. It had recently snowed and we got up to Buffalo Pound and there's a, I don't know, a quarter of a kilometer drive, maybe half a kilometer drive down 
uh, a winding road into the entrance of the park. And I'm driving our Mazda 3. It's a great car. I've got snow tires, but I'm, I drive into the, 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 the extended driveway, the, the, the road that goes into the parking lot and ultimately the park. And there's a lot of snow and there's only a couple of tracks. And I observe. I see deep snow, I see few tracks, and I start to interpret that snow. I start to interpret that data. And I think, hmm, okay, if I go down there and if I happen to get stuck, uh, it's going to ruin our walk. It's going to ruin our afternoon. My wife's not going to be too happy with me. And it's not going to be too happy with having to wait four hours for CAA to come and, you know, dig us out. And so I, I, I asked myself all this really quickly, a matter, a matter of seconds. And I then gather data, interpreted the data, and then I make a decision. I back up and park on the road. And then we walk the half a kilometer in to the entrance of the park, and then we start our hike. Now, that sounds brain dead, benign, obvious, okay? But the reason I use that is because it wasn't that long ago when I would think, I can drive in that road. I've got my Mazda 3. It can drive through anything. And I would have gotten stuck, and I would have had to call CA, and I would have had to wait three, four hours for CA to come and, and pull us out. And my wife wouldn't have been too happy with the whole experience because I've been there, done those kinds of things. Okay. So there's a, a real simple everyday kind of decision where good judgment prevailed. They parked on the road and we had a wonderful time, came back to the car, drove home. Okay. You're in a building program. Well, let's think this through. How much money have I, you know, what's the timing? What's the culture? What's the economy like? What, what's, you know, have I had enough uh, uh, table groups and town halls. Have I gathered enough data, data for a good decision? You're making a new hire. You know, what will that job description entail? Who are you asking to help shape that job description? Is the more data you can gather and interpret that data and then make a decision growing out of that. Friends, we, we, we create a lot of problems for ourselves, not because of poor motives, okay? Not because of bad hearts, not because of unethical decisions. I mean, we sometimes do, but, but there's all kinds of everyday decisions that we make. And they're just less than ideal decisions. They're, they're bad decisions because we've not thought through the full implications of where this decision is going to take me down the road. Okay. So my plea, my encouragement with you is to develop this skill. Good judgment is a learned skill. Okay, it is something that becomes habit, not unlike muscle memory. Okay, I want to take you to a quote by um, uh, by Robert Quinn, and it's from his book uh, "Build a Bridge uh, as You Walk on It." And and I want you to listen to this. This just, this quote describes more than good judgment. But listen to what he says about about the fundamental state of leadership. This is his language: the fundamental state of leadership. It is a temporary psychological condition. When we're in this state, we become more purpose-centered, internally driven, others-focused, and externally open. In the fundamental state of leadership, we become less comfort-centered and more purpose-centered. We stop asking, what do I want, since what we want is to be comfortable. That's true, isn't it? This is the question that keeps us in a, in, in a reactive state, okay, he says. Instead, we need to ask, what result do I want to create, okay? Now, his whole book is exploring this fundamental state of leadership. But let me synthesize the, the thesis of this whole book. And that's this. Leaders are always on. You're, you're always on. It doesn't mean you don't have breaks. It doesn't mean you don't rest. But, but you know, if you're in the grocery store and, and there's somebody you know, you, you engage them politely. You, 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 you're, you're on. Okay. And leaders are always taking in data. You're always evaluating, you're always assessing, you're always observing, you're always asking questions, you're always observing, interpreting, and applying. It's, it's a life skill, it's a disposition, it's a state of mind, it's a fundamental state of leadership where your whole role is, is to be constantly making good decisions because of the data and the information that you have governed by a biblical worldview. As you take in data, you execute wise decisions. And that's what Solomon's getting at. Lord, give me 
knowledge and good judgment. If I believe in your commandments, I've got revelation, but how do I execute? How do I take in so much data? Because so many decisions are not fraught with moral, ethical implications, but some decisions are better than others. Okay. So uh, I want to close with this, and then we can have some Q&A. Uh, I am surrounded by extremely bright people. Uh, I am so proud of our faculty, uh, as I'm sure you are at Heritage. Brilliant minds, brilliant individuals uh, who are committed to research and committed to understanding both simple and complex ideas and taking simple things and understanding their complexities. Okay. I gotta tell you the way my mind works. I like to take complex things and think about them simply, okay? And I need, I need some simple frameworks uh, to help me live life, to live as a Christian, to live as a leader and make decisions all the time. So let me share with you, at least in part, but a significant part of my whole philosophy of leadership. It's right here. The best leadership metaphor is shepherd. You tease that out. You think about what it means to be a shepherd in your context. And don't just think local church. Think your business. Think your family. Think your small group. Think your, your ministry. Think, think all kinds of settings. You, you shepherd the people. And the most critical tasks, the most fundamental tasks as a shepherd are be to protect, to provide, and to guide. And growing out of that, your first objective You'll have many objectives, but your first objective is to create trust, to earn trust so that people see you as trustworthy and therefore willing to follow you. Doesn't mean you're going to be always right. You're going to keep the relationship dynamic and alive. But if they trust you, you have just extended your leadership platform in immense ways. And then leadership's best practice, make good decisions, good judgment. Observe, bring in data as much as you possibly can, reflect upon that data, and then make decisions based on what you see and what you've thought through that are bathed in biblical truth uh, and are executed in a timely, sensitive, caring, appropriate manner. So th there, there are some things for us to digest. Uh, let, me, let me just, um, let me close with this, and let me just uh, read a prayer uh, to you from the Proverbs from a few verses from Proverbs. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? He asks. Take my instruction, wisdom says, instead of silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot be compared with her. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance, and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me, princes rule and nobles, all who govern justly. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently. Find me. May God give us good judgment. God bless you. Turn it back to you, Barry. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Paul Hockey. That is uh, excellent. another excellent session. Uh, very wise counsel for us as ministry leaders. Um, the first question is really one that was uh, posed in the first lecture, and I'll give it to you now. This is from Pastor Telfer, who's in Faith Baptist Church in Echo Bay, and he says, you mentioned endurance. I would love to hear a little more about how we go about building habits, routines, and boundaries that let us rest well, work diligently, and stay healthy for the long term. Oh, uh, well, everybody's got to know their own rhythms. And again, I'll just give you the lens that I work with. Uh, I once heard this from some other source, and I frankly am um, not exactly sure where it came from. Uh, but I heard a helpful analogy that, that sometimes leadership is like an elastic band. 
And as much as I, I do try to honor a Sabbath rest, uh, I, I do try to, um, but, but nevertheless, there are times when you're just stretched, 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 and, and you might go through the month of September and it is like full tilt. Or if you do some significant productions in December, you, you know, December is going to be a, a crazy month. So you, you just need to know that this is going to be uh, a very demanding season, okay? So you've got to mentally prepare for that. Um, eat well, rest well, like care for your body, exercise. But you got to know that there are going to be certain seasons which are going to be extraordinarily demanding. Now, the flip side is, uh, let's, I'll, I'll speak with my candor, uh, summertime is less demanding. It, it, and I'm glad it is. It should be. I, and so I, I read more books. Um, I, I don't stress over uh, uh, um, the pressure of excessive meetings because more people are away. It's just a quieter time. And I have a quieter summer, quieter, quieter summer with, with a good conscience. So you've got to know your own rhythm and the kind of work you're in. I mean, if you're in camp work, it's the exact opposite of what I've just said. But, but again, know, know the rhythm you're in and anticipate difficult times but anticipate more restful times. As I said uh, in the earlier Q&A, uh, we would always as a family build in uh, quarterly breaks of some kind. That's what I need. I don't, I, I don't take my summer off. I just take a couple of weeks in the summer or a week and a half and pepper the other times out throughout the year. Uh, that's the way I function. Some, some of you prefer to take an extended block in the summer, fine, whatever. But know your system, know your routine. But I would also say, exercise, time with family. Remember the bucket diagram? Those things replenish. So I fear I'm just repeating myself. I'm not going deeper to the question, but, but um, uh, it, it, it's actually self-care, self-management. You've got to control your schedule. If you don't, the world will, okay? And so you've got to know what reflect, replenishes your, your energy. How do you care for your body? How do you self-care? How do you care for your family? And you've got to be intentional about that. Barry, I feel like I'm just repeating myself, but I, I hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, this is from David. Regarding succession, how do you know if your leadership team is mature enough to handle an open discussion about succession? Sometimes sharing your heart about planning to leave can leave you dead in the water. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> uh, well, I'll say this. Uh, my approach to leadership and to conversations of all kinds is I, I, I will tell people that I'm going to treat you like a leader. And I'm going I'm to bring you into leadership conversations with transparency and openness. And so when I was a pastor and even in my environment here, I will tell my teams or even our staff meetings that I'm gonna to talk to you like leaders. Here, here's what we're grappling with, okay? And, and I will pepper, or you, I'll use the drip method kind of language. I will, I will drip information along the way so that I'll give permission to talking about um, inevitabilities or, or possible changes or challenges that could come so that we have a, a, a nimble disposition. And so what I mean by that is, um, you know, in my first six months, I'm not gonna be talking about succession all the time, but somewhere in the peppering of my leadership conversations needs to be, you know what? We always need to be building other leaders. We always need to be preparing for the future. We always need to be growing new leaders. See, here's what we've got to release ourselves of. We think we're inexpendable. And we are expendable. That's a good thing. And so you need to talk in those terms that, you know, I'm committed to this place. I love you and, and assure your team that you're there with them committed. But at the same token, just say, you know, we need to be developing leaders because we're all getting old around this table. And we're all getting a little gray. And, and we need to be uh, uh, passing the baton to the next generation. So you're talking about succession in perhaps a more broad way. Don't... Uh, I would not advise, oh, guys, I'm thinking of, of quitting in 18 months. No, now you've just transport, you transport yourself into being a lame duck. I'm not advocating that. But what I am saying, you, you're talking about constant succession. It's the 2 Timothy 2-2, two, two, you know. Uh, Paul invests in Timothy, who would invest in others, who would invest in others also. 
and that kind of disposition and mentality. It isn't just about discipleship, it's also about leadership development. So uh, have those conversations without making them heavy laden things about, oh, I'm wrestling with how long I should stay. That will destabilize, you're right there. And I'm not, I don't talk like that, but I do talk with candor and, uh, and, and, and acknowledgement that yeah, we need to prepare for the next generation and we need to pre pre prepare for the next season of, of leadership. That, that could be a, a tremendously healthy thing. Thank you. From Derek, you've done a great job highlighting the hard work of leadership. Can you talk a little about how you, would have found, how you have found support internally and externally to the church? Great, thank you. Boy, uh, is it Derek, I think, thank you for asking that question because my, my objective has been so, so heavily tilted on get ready, it's gonna to be tough. But you, you also need to know, I love the local church. I, I mean, I love this place. I love what I'm doing now. Um, truly, I do. Uh, but, but I love the church. And I, 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 uh, I have nothing but good to speak of my church experiences. Now, I had bumps along the way. But you've you heard about some. Of them. But uh, I cried with every departure from every ministry of my, when I was an associate, when I was a church planter, and then from Compass Point. I wept because I loved uh, the people and that church so deeply. And, and so let me just remind you, as, as, a, as a leader, you get a front row seat of life change. You get to see real miracles before you. You get to see transformation. You, you get to dedicate children. And, and, and sometimes if you stay long enough, marry those, perform, officiate for the weddings of some of those people. And, and you develop close relationships and, and, and strategic retreats and, and community times and, and Christmas events, and like all those build community. And um, uh, our family has been extraordinarily blessed by the three, three church experiences we've had. And I'm, I'm forever indebted to them and, um, and so grateful for them. And so you have to acknowledge those good things, look to those good things. You also need the disposition of an optimist. Always look for the good, because remember, as I said, you're going to hear a disproportionate amount of negative things. But uh, I love the church, and I, I say that often to our students, uh, because I know there's a there's a, a there's a fresh cynicism out there, isn't there? That the church is, you know, structure and organization and and politics. Well, you know what? This is this, this is our world. This is our reality. This is the bride of Christ, and with all her beauty, beauty and slender, there's brokenness, and the church is like your family. It's beautiful and dysfunctional at the same time. So uh, you, you got to focus on the positive. And uh, I always have tried to do that and have been blessed by the church in so many ways. All right. We have uh, from Peter, senior pastor in Kitchener Waterloo Chinese Alliance Church, the judgment, communication, and execution. How can we involve the community into the process? Instead of feeling top-down, how leaders involve and guide the community into critical discernment and decision. Right. So let me um, let me try and illustrate this uh, with with a helpful model. Okay. Um, I I never go into a meeting with a blank piece of paper, it, not literally, but I, I have an idea of I always have an agenda. And I hold loosely to that agenda. So I'll call, you know, I have an idea and I go into a meeting with that idea, but I'm holding it loosely. That idea is in pencil. Uh, I, I'm not tied to it. I don't own it. It's an idea. And I want to have a conversation with my team about that idea. And that idea gets wrestled with, it gets tweaked, it, it's adjusted. And then I take that idea and it goes through another iteration. And we talk about it some more. And then it, it has some more revamping. And then I'll talk about it with a wider group of people. And it develops some, some, some further content, some further iteration. And every time an idea goes through an iteration, it goes through a cycle. You're widening the circle of people you're engaging in conversation. And in that process, you're refining the idea and you're creating ownership. Not in a manipulative way, but in a, in a legitimate, sincere way. Because every time you, you, you have the conversation with a wider group of people, you listen. And somewhere in that conversation, there are going to be some pearls of wisdom. So these early meetings are, are 
they start with me being alone <laughs> and and then they start with my my team my board you know wherever your first concentric circle of leaders is and then you start widening it now uh, in church contexts uh, we would do periodic town halls now here's the one risk of a town hall you need to make this clear town halls are designed to converse to share plans to share ideas to listen, to take notes, legitimate notes. They need to, they need to have value, they need to be legitimate. But there also needs to be an understanding that hey, every idea that you give us, we may not be able to implement. Okay. So if people say, well, you had a you asked my opinion and it didn't take my opinion. Well, no, no, we a town hall doesn't mean you have to execute, you have to implement every idea that's given to you. But if you if you package the purpose of the town hall or the discussion properly and you say, look, we're soliciting more information. So I'll give you an illustration of this. Our church in Burlington uh, uh, satellited or planted a few churches. And the very first church plant was from Burlington to Waterdown. And uh, I forget the years, but I we we're going to start September of one particular year. We had town halls, and all the data told us we we're, were too early. And the whole initiative was put off by year. Candidly, I was heartbroken. I was just, they weren't following my leadership. They weren't following my idea. And I was kind of, I was kind of bent out of shape over it. But we deferred the whole program another year. We took more time to incubate. And when we launched, it launched with 300 people. We were ready. But that we we're ready because we took another year to do it. And that decision grew out of one of these iterations. My apologies, didn't have my, my phone on silent there. And it was my daughter too. So you do these iterations and that helps you, okay? Define the town hall though, define the conversation. Say, we're, we're looking for input here. We're not, we're not in decision mode yet. We're, we're, the, the, the plan is still soft concrete, but this is what we wanna do, but give us some input. Hope that helps. Here's a question from Ross. Could you comment on how much weight to place on chemistry in a team setting when considering a new leader? Certainly character counts, as does competency. How much, though, should we consider a prospective leader's potential impact on the team dynamics? Right. Good question. So I, I think a chemistry, that's a softer quality, right? Character, competency, we can, we can point to some, some biblical example for this and its significance. A chemistry that's a little bit more nebulous and uh, sometimes a little bit more time to determine chemistry. I mean, sometimes you meet a person, they, oh, I click with them. And sometimes it's at the third or fourth meeting, we kind of go, eh, you know, we're different. So I, I appreciate the question. I'm going to say two different things on this. I think your senior leader, there needs to be good chemistry with the environment that the senior leader is stepping into because culture matters. Uh, was it... Uh, um, Drucker, who said, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And if you've got culture and you've got strategy, culture always wins. Okay, so you need a leader, a senior leader, who's going to step in and get the culture. There's chemistry. There's, yeah, they, they, they fit here. Okay. Um, I, I didn't talk about this in my message, but, uh, uh, you know, do you want to come in as a gunslinger or, or a mayor? Well, you know, some environments, particularly our, our wonderful American brothers and sisters, they, they kind of like their gunslingers, but Canadians, we, we like our mayors, you know, we come in a little bit, you know, go slow, lay low, don't blow. And so chemistry and culture and that kind of connectivity, that matters. Those aren't incidentals, okay? Now, having just said that, on your team, uh, to have some contrarian ideas is a healthy thing. See, here's what's what so often takes place in leadership is the doppelganger effect where, you, where leaders hire people like them or they surround people uh, with people who are like them or, or, or have a similar disposition. And you need people who think a little bit differently. Now, you don't necessarily want the loyal opposition who's challenging everything you say all the time. Don't do that. But, but I think of some of my team relationships. Um, I'm a big picture thinker and I'd come with ideas, you know, back to my iteration. I, and I'd, I'd have one staff member always say, what about this? What about, and she'd immediately go to details. And you know what? There were times I was a little bit irritated, but there are other times I'm kind of going, well, I need this. Yeah, because I haven't thought through the details. And, and having diversity in your team, 
will make will refine the quality of your decisions. So uh, certain roles, chemistry is powerfully important. Culture is absolutely critical. But there are other areas where diverse thinking can be externally helpful for you. There should be unity on certain mission vision values, certainly unity on doctrine. But to have some different thinking, that, that's a healthy thing. One more uh, question from Dan. Really appreciate your reminder to those in the middle years to the importance of endurance. Beyond adjusting our expectations and expecting setbacks and keeping in mind the importance of not giving up, would you have any other suggestions to how in the struggle and the slog, or before the more challenging seasons, we could pursue the development of this quality of endurance? Barry, I'm not sure if this is totally answering our brother's question here, but, but let me try this. I, I never want to judge somebody who leaves a, a situation. I mean, ultimately, we all leave, right? We all, life changes and we all move on and we've got to have the, hopefully we'll see it before other people see it. Okay. So we know there, there, there are, are endings to all of our leadership runs. I mean, it's like David. David served his generation and then died. Um, but, but here's my plea, okay? If you're in a tough season, okay? And, and, and I'm not gonna say you never need to quit because sometimes we find ourselves in toxic situations which you, you need to get out of. Uh, and I, there, those exist. Uh, and there are times when after years and years, we're just tired and it's time for change. But if you're in the midst of something really intense, my plea to you as best as possible to blast through that season, to tie in on the end, bring your best thinking, your, your most disciplined spiritual uh, expressions and functions, uh, your, your most thoughtful engagement in your walk with God, use your head and your objectivity as, as best you can and, and try to ride through that situation until the dust settles. And if, if at the end of that time, you think it's time for a departure, time for leave, that, 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 that may be because, again, we all we come to endings of our, of our season. Um, but, but to not, not do it in the midst of the crisis, that's what's endurance, okay? Because through those times, here's what's happening. God is also at work both in your life and in the life of the organization, and even through a stressful time like Moses, even through those stressful times, God was still shaping Israel and God was shaping Moses. And even through a difficult time with your church, God is shaping that church to refine it into the image of Christ. Okay, Ephesians 4. And he's working in your life too. And you don't want to interrupt that. You don't want to, you don't want to limit that. You don't want to end it too quickly. Okay, so as best you can to ride through that intensity and then when you come through that intense season with greater objective, uh, objectivity to say, you know what, have I brought all the contribution I can bring to this particular ministry setting? And maybe it is time for a change, but I want to transition with thought to succession and finish well. But if I'm answering the question, what I'm trying to get at is, is whatever you do, try to hang on in that intense time, okay? And, and, and uh, give attention to self-care, fill the cup with energy, replenish, uh, but but do your best not to quit in that moment because you'll feel defeated and disappointed with yourself and the church is robbed of that opportunity to grow. That's not an absolute, but that would be my opinion. Thank you. Uh, I uh, think it might be good for you, Dr. Powalki, to give us maybe two or three books that you found extremely helpful for ministry leadership. So I've referred to uh, uh, certainly one of them right here. I, I think uh, Lanny X book is outstanding. Now, here's what it doesn't give you. He doesn't draw all kinds of applications today. Okay, that's where you've got to do your homework. But, but this is a keeper because um, he, he, he presses you to think about biblical leadership. Okay. And and, uh, and then you make the application to your context. What does protect, provide, guide look like in your setting? 
but he gives he does a beautiful job. The other book I'll reference um, maybe would be um, uh, a book by Marcus Buckingham. Um, and uh, the one thing you need to know, and it, it's, it's an excellent book. It's not a, this is not a Christian book, but it's a great book that helps you navigate the difference between leadership and management, because some of you are more big picture, forward thinking leaders. Leaders are concerned about the future and leaders are concerned about the whole. And managers tend to be more concerned about the process and about the individual. OK, that's a generalization. Um, uh, Buckingham teases that out quite nicely, but I find that to be a really helpful tool because some of you are more wired as managers, some of you are more wired as leaders, and you need to surround yourself with people who, who understand the role as well. And if you're probably a leader, you need to make sure you got a manager with you. Now, if you're more of a manager and you're in a point role, then you need to expand your management to think more like a leader. And maybe you need to surround yourself with people with gifts of leadership. So I, I think that is also uh, a very, a very helpful book. Um, just one more book, nothing to do with leadership, but it's about caring for your soul. Uh, Knowledge of the Holy, A.W. Tozer. Just feed your soul. Feed your soul on the nature and character of God. So there's a few books for you, Barry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a great day, and uh, you've given us lots of uh, ministry wisdom to help us uh, think through our own ministries. Um, I'd like to, before we close and leave, I want us to be aware that next fall, that is probably the first Thursday in October, that we are going to be having our Heritage Preaching Lectures, and we have Dr. Daryl Johnson coming uh, to our, our location to do that. We hope that we will be able to have it live, but we will wait and see with that. Dr. Johnson has been here before with us. He is, his book that is uh, well known is The Glory of Preaching, a very excellent book on the subject of preaching. But he's written other books like Experiencing the Trinity or Discipleship on the Edge, which deals with the book of Revelation or the story of all stories, and uh, who is Jesus. So he's written a number of books, and also a number of his messages are online. If you just put his name in there, Daryl Johnson, and even put the word preaching, it'll come up. Well, thank you very much uh, for participating today in our Heritage Ministry Leadership Day. It's been good to have you, and... Uh, May the Lord bless you. Amen.